When you're working on a really important or high stakes writing project, you might think that the hardest part is done once you've got words on the page or on the screen as it were. But in fact, the fun is just beginning. Now you've got to revise your words to make them the best words that they can be. Revision honestly is not that fun. It can be kind of disheartening, especially since we take our writing very seriously and it's very personal. So today I'll provide you with three techniques to tune up your sentences with the help of some members of the undead. Spooky. So you did some writing and you've got those words on the page, but you know that those words could be better. You could be using more specific words. You could be more concise and exciting with your writing. You could convey your point in a more accurate or impactful way. So what do you do to take your blah writing to better? There are three ways that I will show you today to fine tune your sentences, to punch them up, make them more exciting, and to make you say what you're really trying to say. These three methods include getting rid of passive voice, strengthening your action verbs, and changing up the types of sentences that you use. So today I'll teach you what passive voice is, how to eliminate tired verbs, and the four types of sentences and how to use them to your advantage. So first things first, passive voice. You may have heard about it before or been told to avoid it. Passive voice can actually sometimes be helpful or serve a really important purpose. So what is passive voice? Basically, it's when we use forms of the verb to be or to have in order to make the object of an action into the subject of a sentence. What does that mean, though? Here's an example. Think of the difference between the two sentences I'm going to provide you now. First, the zombies were slain by the student. Second, the student slayed the zombies. You'll notice here that in the zombies were slain by the student, there's a verb construction right in the middle of the sentence. Instead of the student being the one slaying the zombies, it's the zombies were slain by the student. Were is a form of the verb to be. It's the past tense, is, are, was, were. By putting this in the middle of the sentence, we remove the student's agency in slaying the zombies. We separate the student from the actions that they're doing. The sentence no longer tells us that the student slayed the zombies, but rather the zombies were slain by the student, making the zombies the subject and object of the sentence. So how is this used outside of supernatural contexts? Passive voice is often used with a distinct purpose in mind. Think about these three different fields of practice. In historical or literary writing, we can say, some people say, or just argued that, we get more specifics when we say, critics argued that. In scientific writing, passive voice is very common in things like scientific articles and lab reports to make the science appear as objective as possible. If we say the researcher weighed the samples, we know who's doing the weighing. But if we say the samples were weighed, we remove the human from the equation entirely, making the process seem more objective and repl replicable. Passive voice can also be used to displace blame or fault. Think of the difference between these two sentences. Mistakes were made. Well, who made the mistakes? Versus the analysts made mistakes, which is assigning blame. In some cases where we want to seem less at fault, we might use passive voice. Or in places where we're wanting to seem objective, um, or remove the human element from a situation. But generally, Eliminating passive voice helps tune up sentences in a way that makes them briefer, more punchy, easier to read, and easier to understand. So how do I know that I'm using passive voice so I can eliminate it? This is where zombies come in. If you can add the phrase by zombies after the verb in a sentence, it's in the passive voice. So for example, if I say the shopping mall was attacked, you can add by zombies to the end and it's in the passive voice. If I say a hungry horde of zombies attacked the shopping mall, if I add by zombies to the end, it doesn't make sense. It's actually kind of redundant. If we again go to normal business context, the same thing applies. 
the samples were weighed by zombies versus the research assistant weighed the samples by zombies. By eliminating passive voice when possible, um, especially if it's not particularly appropriate or necessary, you make your writing easier to read. Second up, action verbs. So for those who need a little schoolhouse rock review, a verb is an action word. It's something that happens or occurs, or a state of being. Highly recommend the schoolhouse rock verb video if you want a little review. We often rely upon the same kind of tired or boring verbs that don't really tell us what action is going on when we write. These are often state of being verbs. So words like are, was, should, might, or did. How do we tune up these verbs to make them more specific? Now we come back to our zombies. Kill is a pretty strong verb, but again can be kind of nonspecific. Did our human kill the zombie, or did she slay, murder, fillet, the head, hack, demolish, and trap, smite, or obliterate the zombie? Each of these verbs has a really specific connotation and is also a little bit more dynamic and exciting than the perhaps tired verb kill. If we're going to talk corporate or industrial about it, if we have a company that kills zombies, it's kind of non-specific. Non -specific. What's our purpose in killing zombies and what's the method by which we go about killing zombies? Do we kill them or do we eliminate them? A stronger verb has the connotation of wiping the scourge from the face of the earth. Do we ensure zombie-free zones, kind of some corporate language, or do we, even more specifically, pinpoint zombie dens and capture the undead for innovative plague research? Kidding aside, there are lots of lists of specific action verbs online to help you to make your writing a little bit more targeted. This is especially helpful when you're working on resumes or cover letters, as there are lists of action verbs that are grouped into specific skill sets to help you demonstrate the type of teaching or research or leadership or communication skills that are most important to you and the type of job that you want. Third and finally, sentence types. This is the thing that the most students are least familiar with when we're talking about cleaning up our writing and making it more dynamic and interesting. There are four main types of sentences. You need to understand before you get to varying your sentence patterns and understanding how to use them effectively. To know the differences between sentence types, we first need to know what clauses are. So an independent clause versus a dependent clause. An independent clause is just that. It can stand on its own to form a complete sentence. It has a subject and a verb. So for example, if I say that I, Allegra, went to Meyer, that's an independent clause. It's a complete sentence. There's a subject, uh, me, and there's a verb, went or to go. Not a very specific verb. Maybe you could say I traveled or bicycled or crawled to Meyer uh, to punch up that sentence a little. A dependent clause needs another clause to make a complete sentence. It can't stand on its own because it's lacking a subject or a verb or something else to make it a complete thought. If you've heard that you're using sentence fragments before, then that's usually because you have a dependent clause that's missing some kind of an item to make it a complete sentence. So for example, I went to Meyer and I bought zombie hunting supplies. The and bought zombie hunting supplies part of this sentence after the comma is a dependent clause. It depends upon the previous clause in the sentence to make it a complete thought because I don't say and Allegra bought zombie hunting supplies. There's no subject in this clause. And bought zombie hunting supplies by itself does not form a complete sentence. That's why it needs an independent clause to hook it to, to make it not a sentence fragment. So clauses aside, there are four main types of sentences. Simple, compound, compound complex, and complex. So we'll start with simple and work our way up to the more complicated ones. A simple sentence just has an independent clause, no dependent clauses. So if I say, I like watching iZombie, which is one of my favorite television shows. That's a simple sentence. One subject, one verb. Pretty easy. Moving on as we get more complicated. 
Compound sentences can have multiple independent clauses that can stand on their own, but no dependent clauses. I like watching iZombie, and all five seasons are available on Netflix. Both of those uh, parts of the sentence in green are independent clauses. They can stand on their own as logical, complete sentences. However, there's no dependent clauses here, which is what makes it a compound sentence. All of this is true, by the way. I highly recommend that you watch iZombie on Netflix. Complex sentences get a little more, well, complex. We throw dependent clauses into the mix. A complex sentence has at least it has one independent clause and at least one dependent clause. Here are a couple of examples because there are lots of different configurations of complex sentences. First, iZombie, which is one of my favorite shows, is available on Amazon Prime. Here, the independent clause is actually split up. It's separated by the dependent clause. So iZombie is available on Amazon Prime is one complete independent thought with a subject and a verb. However, which is one of my favorite shows cannot stand as a sentence on its own. It's the dependent clause. The second one, after five seasons, I still like iZombie, has the dependent clause at the beginning and the independent clause at the end. After five seasons, lacks a verb, which means that it is not a full sentence on its own. So as you can guess, compound complex sentences, the most complicated of them all, have multiple independent clauses and at least one dependent clause. So multiple clauses that can stand as their own complete thought and at least one dependent clause that cannot. So here's my example. iZombie is such a successful show because it operates in a hybrid genre space. It is a romantic comedy zombie drama or a rom-com zomdrom. So you see here that because it operates in a hybrid genre space is a, a dependent clause because we don't know to what it is referring to and or a rom-com zomdrom also is because there's no verb there and we have two clear independent clauses as well making our compound complex sentence. So what do we do with this knowledge? Now you can use your understanding of the four different types of sentences to try and vary the types in your own writing. A lot of the time, people will either be on one end or the other of the spectrum. They'll have really simple sentences throughout their writing, which can make it seem terse or choppy, or they'll have lots of complex or compound complex sentences that can make the writing hard to follow and quite frankly, kind of boring. Lots of commas or internal punctuation has a tendency to put your audience to sleep. So by identifying the different types of sentences in your work, being aware of the type or types that you most commonly use and consciously trying to vary them up or revise them so that you use different types, maybe shorter when you're emphasizing things or longer when you have a point with multiple parts, you can make your writing more effective, more dynamic, and more user-friendly. And the same goes for thinking about passive voice and thinking about action verbs. Now you have not one, not two, but three tools to tune up the sentences in your writing and make them more interesting and more effective for your reader. So now it's up to you to put these tools into practice. Thanks for listening and best of luck tuning up your sentences and fighting those zombies.